Good morning, Reese Church. Is everybody doing okay? Good. Well, I told you we're just believing God for him to do some powerful things in our midst today, so we're going to do something that we normally don't do. Would you just do me a favor to just stand your feet for a second? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our little praise break right here in the beginning of service for a second, and I want you to take 10, 15 seconds if you would. Will you just clap your hands and make some noise for Christ this morning to give us how thankful he is? Second, Father, we welcome you in this place. Come on, church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Those lyrics on that song said, this borrowed breath that I have. How many know that he has given us our breath and has said, if we're borrowed, you know that I'm going to give it back to him. Amen. Amen. So if you want to stand up, you can. If you want to be seated, you may be seated, but you can try. You know, I feel like worship, learning to worship and just being expressive like that, it's something that you learn. Um, You know, as football season's on, I think about this. Obviously, college football was yesterday and NFL games are today. And here's something I know is that what we see take place on Saturday and what we see take place on Sunday is just a result of what's taking place throughout the week. Think about that. They don't just show up on Saturday on game day and say, okay, coach, I'm ready. How many know there's been months and months of preparation that we've seen that we have not seen that goes in to do that? It's the same thing I think it is with praise and worship. Sometimes I believe it's a sacrifice of praise, the Bible says. How many know sometimes when you walk in this place, let me know, you just don't feel like worshiping. How many know you've had a bad week? If everything's gone wrong, that's kind of gone wrong, including your pet's head's falling off, right? That's a, I won't even talk about it anyway. And you don't feel like it. But how many know sometimes you just got to come in and say, you know what? I don't care whether you feel like it or not. You are, I am going to worship God this morning. Amen? And that's where we're headed as a church. We're going to learn to worship him whether we feel like it or not. Because how many know our feelings don't really determine whether God is worthy of our worship or not? Amen? And so we are becoming a worshiping church. Can you say amen to that? Well, welcome. If this is your first time, we are so glad that you're here. Uh, Can we give the first-time guests another huge round of applause, church? Come on. I just want to remind you of a couple things before we get started with today's message. Um, If you're new to Reach, like I said, we would love to meet you at the Meet the Pastors Night or maybe that you've been attending the church for a while and we've never really connected with you. I encourage you to please fill out that sign-up sheet that you handed out. And when you're coming in your handout this morning, take it out at the Information Center. We would love to spend the night with you, just the opportunity just to meet you. We are providing child care and free dinner, so make sure you sign up for that. Amen. Amen. Also, kickoff of small groups is today. You should have got a handout when you walked in this morning. There's a list of those. And also, you can go on our website and see all the groups that are listed on there, when they're meeting, and all the leaders' contact information on there. And so we want to include everybody to be a part of small groups this semester. Amen. Amen. Lastly is this. We are in week two of our 21 day of prayer and fasting. Is everybody doing good? Prayer and fasting? Anybody else flesh just crying out? Sometimes I'm just being honest and transparent. Sometimes I, this, this past week I've caught myself walking into the pantry and just simply looking. <laughs> and maybe you can't do that because it's temptation for you, but it's like osmosis for me. Like it's a little transferent. I'll open it up and I'll look in there and I'll, and I'll see that oatmeal cream pie and I'll just be like, mmm, that's good. You know. And I'll look at some of the candy in there, and then Sarah, she'll just be eating candy at night and stuff, and i just be like, hey, sinner. You know, because I feel like I've really grown in my faith in the last eight years is that in the past I'd probably be like, hey, babe, here's what you probably should fast for. Just being honest, I mean, I was pretty good at telling people what they should fast for, but I'm letting the Lord deal with her on these things, and so she's dealing with, she's fasting other things that I'm not fasting, Right? And I'm fasting other things that she's fasting, and so sometimes she'll sit down at night, we'll turn on a show, and she'll be something, and I'm just literally, I'm just like, hope that's good. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Well, I want to encourage everybody to fast something. 
And if you were gone last week, do me a huge favor. If you happen to be serving in the kids' ministry, do me a big favor and go to our app or go to our YouTube page uh, or channel, I guess, and watch last week's message. I taught a message on fasting that I've never taught before. And I think that I hopefully if you'll go back and listen to it, you'll understand the importance of fasting. Uh, fasting is not something that we did in the Old Testament, something that we, God expects us to do in the New Testament. Um, we're not earning God's favor. We're not earning God's love by fasting. Uh, fasting doesn't change God. Listen to me, fasting changes us. Amen. Amen. Uh, just another encouragement for you is that, you know, you can't ask for anything outside of God's will during your fast. I just want to encourage you with that. Amen? Just because you're fasting, you can't ask for anything outside of the will. When you pray, when we're fasting, we're asking for things according to his word. And if we believe in that, and we learned last week, because here's the truth, something just won't change without fasting. Amen. Tell both your neighbors, say, go listen. Go listen. Go listen. Go listen. Go listen. Go listen. Uh, we're going to continue to open up the church from noon to 1 this week, Monday through Friday. And so I encourage you, and I also want to thank you for those who have stopped by this past week. It's been a great uh, to see you guys come out and pray with us from 12 to 1. And then we had a turnout on Saturday as well, and so we're going to continue to do that. So Monday through Friday, 12 to 1 right here, and Saturday from 8 to 9, and I encourage you to come join us. I love it because some people have came in here and literally stayed maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and then they've left, and it just really blessed me because they said, you know what, I'll do that for 15 or 20 minutes. So I would encourage you to make some time, come join us uh, for this time of prayer. And then lastly is this, um, man, I'm excited about that night of worship. And I don't see no reason why we don't pack this place out. Amen. Amen. If this is one service and we're in here like this and we're doing that a second service, then how many know when we come together with one service that night, this place should be full. And not it should be a full in attendance, but I'm going to encourage you more importantly, let's be full of expectation of what God is going to do. I've got some wonderful testimonies this week of already of God's doing. People have handed me stuff that they've given up. People have showed me about stuff they've given up. And I believe that God is continuing. Here's the word that we're using. It's a breakthrough, right? That's the idea of what God says when he says, this is the fast that I've chosen for you. If you look it up in Isaiah, it's a, it's a fast of one that we experience breakthrough in our lives. Tell both of your neighbors, say breakthrough. breakthrough. Let's move on before I get excited. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for today, God. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit. God, what a sweet spirit it was in this place, Lord God. Just hearing your people just worship you this morning. And, Father, I thank you that we'll continue to make ways just to worship you, Lord God, all throughout the week. Lord, in the next few moments as we open up your word, God, I pray more importantly that you'd open up our hearts. God, I pray that you'd use me to speak your word this morning. Holy Spirit, bring things back to my memories that you want me to say. But more importantly, help me to say a thing that I didn't plan on saying that somebody in this place needs to say. And, Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, and everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, today's message is going to be about some things that I learned while I was on my sabbatical this summer. Um, and I believe it's going to apply to your life as well. For those of you maybe who are new to REACH and didn't know, uh, I uh, took my first ever sabbatical. What is a sabbatical? It's just some extended time off. I took about six weeks off this summer. And so these are going to be some things that I learned while I was off. And I believe if you'll listen, I believe it will apply to your life as well. Before I get started with those, I do want to offer an apology, though. Uh, this isn't in my message as uh, far as a point, but it is a point that I personally learned, and I want to offer my apology to you, and that's this. I apologize for not giving an exact date when I was coming back. And so I learned. How many know all we can do in life is learn? And so I own that, and I made a big mistake because when I announced to you guys I was taking a sabbatical, what I didn't do was announce when I was coming back. And I apologize for maybe any confusion or any stress that it might have caused on anybody. And I promise you I will never make that mistake again. And so when my next sabbatical, whenever that is, I will promise you there will be a start date and there will be an end date. And that way nobody has to worry because here's the good news, I'm back. Amen. It's good news for some of you, I guess. Some of us, not so good news. <laughs> Either way, the truth is I'm back. Uh, I wanted to offer a sincere apology to my staff and to my board. I feel like I put them in a little, uh, not a little, but an awkward situation where they're probably having to answer a lot of questions, especially towards the end, four week, five weeks of, hey, when's Pastor Chad coming back? And unfortunately, I didn't have an exact date for them, and that's my fault, and so they didn't know. And so I want to publicly apologize to them and to the church for not having an exact date, and I hope you all will accept my apology and realize lesson learned won't happen again. And you say, amen. amen. Some of you say, I don't even know what he's talking about this morning. <laughs> so 
I don't even know what a sabbatical is. So if you're taking notes, which I hope you are each and every week when you come in this place, I want to show here's the first lesson I learned while I was on my sabbatical. And number one is this, life is short. I was met with this reality very hard while I was on my sabbatical. For some of you who don't know, while I was on my sabbatical, and that's part of the reason I didn't have an exact date, my mom passed away unexpectedly. Um, didn't know it. We, my mom wasn't sick. My mom wasn't going any through anything like that. Uh, just got a phone call one morning at about 4 o'clock, and my dad was on the other line, and he was telling me that I needed to go home, that my mom wasn't going to make it. And so, unfortunately, my mom didn't make it. Uh, I would say, unfortunately for me, fortunate for her. Uh, I know where she is. And, uh, but we're down here is the one who are dealing with the sadness. Amen? I don't think that she's that way, but I think we're left that way. And so these are some of the things that I learned while I was gone and just that life is way too short to be angry, to be upset, to hold unforgiveness, to be bitter to somebody, to be mad at somebody. Let me tell you something. It, life is just a blip, just like that. And so this is something that I learned personally as I went through this is that, you know, there's never a good time for losing a loved one. But I realized through this is that my perception of a lot of things have changed. Things that once maybe caused me a lot of stress and anxiety, now I realize truly in this really doesn't matter. When you compare it to these things, and so that's what I want to share with you this morning is this church, is tell both of your neighbors, say, life's too short. And here's the other thing. Life's way too precious. Amen? Life's too short and life's too precious. Proverbs 27.1 says this. Don't brag about what may happen tomorrow because you have no idea what it will bring. You have no idea. This week marked the 18th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. How many of you are old enough to remember where you were when the tax took place on 9-11? This is when we know we're getting older because I realized this week that there are people like in the youth group that they, they weren't even born when September 11 happened. And uh, how many of you weren't born or don't when, when September 11 happened? There, all of our youth over there, yep. How, man, we're getting old, aren't we? Isn't that crazy? Can you believe that, can you believe that was 18 years ago? How many of you remember right where you were when the news broke? Raise your hand. You can remember it. You don't think that life is short? 18 years ago, you knew exactly where you were standing probably, don't you? And you knew exactly what was happening. And look, here we are standing on the other side of 18 years. And I had some thoughts concerning 9-11, how it relates to us today. Approximately 3,000 people would, spending, would be spending their last night with their family, and they, never even, and they didn't even know it. 3,000 people approximately would be spending their last night with their family and they had no idea. I wonder how different their night would have been and the days and the months leading up to that night if they realized that September 11th of 2001 would be their last night with their families. I wonder if they would have went to bed angry at their spouse. I wonder if they would have been like, man, my kids are just driving me crazy. Or would they have been like, if they would have known, they're like, you know what? I'm not going to bed tonight because I'm going to spend every lasting moment I can with my children. Amen. They would have been like, you know what? What we're arguing over doesn't really matter. The things that I'm worried about, the things that I'm concerned about, if they would have known that September 11th would have been their last night, I believe that it would have changed how they were living. And I believe if you and I can grasp this concept that life is short, it will change the way that we're living. How many of you were 10 and now you're 70? Raise your hand. Do we have any? I mean, honestly, like, you, like you, you're just 10 and now, like, you know, next thing you know, blink, you're 70. How many of you are 10 and now you're 50? How many of you can't even remember how old you are? Man, now you know you're old when you're in that category. <laughs> right? Mm. Couple thoughts. 
245 people went to bed thinking they were catching a flight to somewhere only to realize they would never make it and they would never fly home. Over 300 firemen, 60 police officers, and eight paramedics went to bed knowing they had to be at work the next morning. Little did they know they would never make it past 10 a.m. They never would. I wonder how things would be different in their lives if they would have known the fact that that was their last day. They would have known they'll never see their families again. How would their lives be different? A famous psalmist wrote a song about this that you might be familiar with. Um, I think it's found in Psalms 151, if I'm not mistaken. And they wrote a song about it, and I think you might recognize it. Go ahead. Uh, and see me if you recognize this famous song that was written from our psalmist. I would highly recommend all of that except for the bull riding part. <laughs> Some of you don't know, there is no Psalms 151. And that great psalmist is the name of guy by the name of uh, anybody? Tim McGraw. Tim McGraw. Very good. I don't know if a better song could be written. And if there was a psalmist that would probably wrote that, these are the words he would use, that we needed to learn to live like we're dying because here's the truth I want to tell you, not in some weird way, but here's the truth. We're all dying. And I want to encourage you this morning, and I want to encourage myself Let's start living like we're dying. Let's offer forgiveness. Let's love sweeter. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Those words he told us, man, and whatever you're afraid of pursuing, let me tell you something. Life's too short. Pursue it. Amen. Whatever you're passionate about, whatever you're afraid of, whatever is holding you back in this life, let me tell you something. Life is way too short. Go after your dreams. Go after your passions. Pursue it with everything you got. One day you're going to wake up and you're going to have regret. You're going to say, my gosh, I wish I would have done it. Don't let anything hold you back. Tell both your neighbors, say, life is way too short. short. Write this down. If we aren't promised tomorrow, then let's realize how important today really is. If we aren't promised tomorrow, then let's realize how important today really is. Grab your spouse. Say, man, you were wrong last night, but I still love you. (laughs) Right? It's never your fault. Let's be honest. Go ahead and put that blame on them. But do the most important thing. Say, I love you. And I want to say something to you, people who are blessed to have your mom and dad alive, don't you dare neglect picking up that phone and tell them that you love them. If you've got brothers and sisters that are alive today, don't you neglect picking up that phone and calling them. Because I'm telling you, there's going to come a day that you're going to be like me. You're going to stand here. You're going to say, I wish I could pick up the phone and I wish I could call my mom. So glad that I had the time with her that I did before she passed. But man, if I would only known July 16th, 2019 would have been my mom's last day, I promise you, I would have done things differently. Here's what I'm going to tell you. The Bible tells us there's a day chosen for each one of us. There is. There is. And I want to say this. On top of that, September is National Suicide Prevention Month. And it's very difficult to even talk about because we got people in our congregation who have experienced this in their lives. But listen to me. You don't have to do this alone. You don't have to do this alone. 
You don't have to do it alone. Life is too, too short for you not to pursue your dreams. Don't let the fear of the unknown keep you captive any longer. Don't let the fear of what could happen keep you from what you want to happen, but more importantly, probably what should happen. I'm going to say that again. Don't let the fear of what could happen keep you from what you want to happen, but more importantly, what should happen. Some of you got things inside of your hearts that you know that you want to do, but you're letting fear keep you from pursuing those things. And I would say this, pursue them. Pursue them with all that you've got this morning. I'm not telling you to be foolish, but I'm telling you to pursue them, whatever that might be. I want to say something that I don't want you to take my words out of context or try to twist my words around to fit your situation. But here's what I want to tell you. Life is way too short for you to be miserable and stressed out all the time. Let me say that again. Life is way too precious and way too short for you to be miserable and stressed out all the time. What I didn't say is for you to go quit your job tomorrow morning (laughs) or to leave your spouse. I didn't say that. What I said was, life is way too precious and life is way too short for you to be miserable and unhappy all the time. Begin to take steps where those things don't be like that. If you're so stressed out all the time and you got two brand new cars in the driveway, go sell them. You know what I'm saying? Go buy a used car where you don't have to work 80 hours a week. Maybe the season you can go. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with a new car. I'm just saying, but if you are so stressed out and you go from one thing to the next, all, all, all I do is ever work. Can you make some changes in your life that all you don't have to do is work? Because here's the truth. When you get to the end of your life, you're not going to say, I wish I had a bigger house. I wish I had a new car. You're going to say, I wish I had more moments with those people that were closest to me. That's what's really going to matter. As I sat in the room as my mom passed, I can assure you, I didn't think, why didn't they buy us a bigger house? And I can tell you, I, I, on this side of it, I wish they would have. I was in high school sharing a waterbed with my brother. <laughs> I'm just saying. Some of you people think you have it so bad you share a room until you share a bed and it's a waterbed. I don't want to hear you crying anymore. I was a 16-year-old kid on a waterbed with my 18-year-old brother. Not because Aunt Susie was in town. We had to do it one weekend, but that's what we did. But I didn't sit there as my mom and think, you know what? Why didn't you buy us a bigger house? I thought to myself, I wish I had more time. I would do things so much more different if I had more time. So what I'm saying, does that, does that make sense? Let me give you an illustration that maybe will help you what I'm talking about. Uh, how many of you guys know what this is? Some of you who are over 60 are struggling right now. Oh, come on, you guys, I'm trying to lighten the loot. I was just heavy for a second, so I'm trying to lighten it up. If you know what this is, raise your hand. If you know what this is. If you can't see what this is, raise your hand. Go ahead. (laughs) If you're under 40 and you can't see what this is, please raise your hand. Now, everybody, stretch your hands towards them. Restore sight. I got to move on. Uh, it's a key fob. <laughs> mm. 
Mm. It's a key fob. Tell your neighbor it's a key fob. I don't know if you have one of these for your car or not. Uh, they're, I don't know what year they started doing this. They started giving key fobs instead of keys. Uh, but here's how my car works is that you can't start my car unless you have this. Now, listen, you can get in there. You can push all the buttons you want. There's even a button that says start on my car. You can go in there and push start. But here's the deal. Unless you have this key fob, it's not going to start my car. And here's what I'm trying to tell you. Some of you guys have been given your key fob to other people and to other things. The key fob represents power. You can't start it without this. Listen to me. Don't you dare give somebody or something the power to choose whether you're going to be happy or not. Some of you need to choose to keep your key fob in your pocket and keep giving it away. Some of you, you're giving your key fob to the government. You turn on the news. Here, can I just tell you a piece of advice? Don't turn on the news. <laughs> Instead of being so angry about what they're saying every time you turn on the news, I know this is crazy, but maybe you shouldn't turn it on if it's going to make you that angry. I'm just saying. Some of you are looking at your job, and you go into work every morning, and you walk in, and you hand your job your key fob. There it is. And you walk away from it. And now you no longer have the power whether you choose. You're giving that power to somebody else. Some of you have given your key fob to relationships. I'll only be happy if, right? Some of you have given your key fob to your house. Some of you have given your key fob to your car, your finances. I don't know what you're giving your key fob to, but here's the thing. You're in control. You're in control. You can try to steal my car all you want, but listen to me. Now that you know how to take my car, if you walk up to it, I am not willingly giving you my key fob. It's going to be a fight. Some of you need to stand up and say, you know what? Hey, devil, not today, as we've been saying. Say, you know what? Not my family. I've got my key fob, and I'm holding on to it. And if you think that you're going to come take this, I want you to know something. You're in for a fight, bro. And I want you to know that. I'm willing to fight for my family. I'm willing to fight for my finance. I'm willing to fight for my health. I don't care what you're going through this morning, but some of you need to grab a hold of that key fob and say, you know what, God, you've given it to me, and it's my choice who I give it to, and I will. If you've given it away, you need to take it back. Turn to your neighbor and say, take it back. Take it back. Take it back. Amen? Amen. Some of you are miserable, and it's because you've given your key fob away to something or someone. Write this down. Don't give anyone or anything the power to determine whether you're going to be happy or not. Don't you do it. Don't you give anyone, well, if they start doing this, then I'm going to do this. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not giving anyone the power. See, I had to learn this as a pastor because what would happen in the last eight years, people would leave. And I don't understand why. We're the best church in Sand Springs, right? That's just a little joke. But now I do understand why. And here's the truth. I believe the church is for everyone. Reach just as it happened to be for everyone. But the capital C church is for everyone. Amen? But we just don't happen to be for everyone. But in the early years, if you came in and you left, here's what usually what I would do. I would just, as you left, I would hand you my key fob and say, man, that really is bothering me. And my happiness, my joy 
was determined on how many people would be here on a Sunday morning and if it wasn't there. And here's the thing I learned, and Ketcher learned this, he shared this with me a while back, is that if you're not careful, for like for me, my example would be I would be so focused on who wasn't there that I forgot about all you wonderful people that who are here. Man. Huh? Oh, so-and-so is not here, so-and-so left, but man, look at all the wonderful people that are still here and who still love God, who love Reach, and who love Sarah and I, amen? And I was given, so I, you may not be a pastor and deal with that, but there's other things in your life that you deal with in your situation, and believe you're like, basically you're saying, here's my key fob, go ahead, take my joy. Tell both your neighbors, say, put it back in your pocket. Hmm. Lesson two I learned. Number two, it's okay not to be okay. Somebody just shout it to your neighbors, say, it's okay not to be okay. okay I know most of us in here this morning are Christians, and we're good at pretending that everything is okay in our lives, but the truth of the matter is, it's okay not to be okay. Write this down. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to pretend everything is okay. That's what's wrong. It's okay not to be okay, but what's not okay is you coming in this place and you're pretending that everything is okay. Newsflash. Everybody in this room at some point in their life, right now, it's, they're not okay. We're all going through something, probably right now. If you're going through something, just by a show of hands, I don't care if it's small to it's something very big in your face. If you happen to be going through something in your life at this time, raise your hand. If you're just going through something. Keep it up. Go ahead. If you're going through something. 90. Five or more percent of us are all going through something right now. The other four are going to be outside counseling us when service is over. <laughs> Amen? And for the other four percent who didn't raise their hand, if you would come down front, maybe after service just pray, lay hands on the rest of us, 96, I, I would receive that anointing. I'm, I'm joking. But maybe there's some people in here that say, you know, right now everything is, you know, is going okay. And I, I don't want to make light of that because you say, hey, I'm, I'm in a good season of my life. And I want to say this, good for you. I mean, I, I don't mean that in sarcastic. I mean that. I mean, if you're in a situation where you're saying, I, I, don't, I, I think I'm, I'm okay. And you know what? Praise God. And this is not to be anti-faith, but guess what? Tomorrow's coming. <laughs> right? How many of you were okay, and then 10 seconds later, you weren't okay? <laughs> then you've never been a parent. <laughs> right? I mean, just you can be fine, and then all of a sudden, you're not fine. I mean, Sarah struggles with that all the time. <laughs> I've got it down. Tell you, it's okay not to be okay. While I was on my sabbatical this summer, I went to see my counselor and was sharing with some things, and while I was in there, Numerous times I actually saw multiple church members in the waiting room while I was waiting to go back to see the counselor. And that's how much I believe in our counselor is that I send you the same place that I go. Amen. Yeah. And so I literally, I mean, it's, it happened multiple times. I saw some of you where I send you. And I would ask you how you ask me. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. <laughs> right? So one time I was waiting to go back and I was talking to a church member and my counselor walked out and he was like, Pastor Chad, you ready? And I was having an engaged conversation with this church member and he could tell obviously it wasn't just a casual conversation. So we're walking back there. He was like, uh, do you know them? I was like, yeah. It's one of the church members. He was like, well, first, thanks. I was like, thanks. He's like, yeah, for sending us people. <laughs> I was like, oh, you're welcome. He said, hey, I just want you to know something. He said, have you ran into several church members? I said, yeah. I said, believe it or not, I actually have. He's like, well, that's good. And I was like, well, I don't know if it's good or not. You know, as in like, you know, I was like, yeah. He said, hey, I want to tell you something. I said, yeah. He said, hey, we have a side door. I said, a what? He said, a side door. I said, for what? He said, 
like the staff comes in the side doors and then we have some other pastors and other some high profile clients that we allow to use the side door. And so in case you don't want to run in any of your church members, I'm going to allow you to come in the side door if you want to. And I was just about to say, oh, heck yes. Because I didn't want to run at any of you anymore and hear your problems. <laughs> I was dealing with my own problems. I was just about to say yes, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, don't you dare say yes to that. Because he said this to me, they need to know that it's okay not to be okay. Amen. It's okay. It's okay. I saw my pastor at the counseling office. Yeah, you did. And here's the truth. I should see more of you probably at the counseling office as we pass by. <laughs> and some of you have no excuse because I even offered to pay for you to go to counseling. <laughs> Holy Spirit, speak to them. Right? It's okay not to be okay. I want to offer you a couple of things here as we get ready to close out. Romans 4, 18 through verse 19 says this. Against all hope. Have you been there before? Yes. You didn't feel like there was any hope against all hope? I want to encourage you this morning. Against all hope, Abraham in hope still was believing God. I don't know what you're facing this morning, but I want to encourage you to continue to believe God. And so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now look at verse 19. I love this. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Listen to me. One of the greatest things that you can do for yourself this morning is to realize that it's not okay, it's okay to not be okay, and some of you just simply need to face some facts in your life. It's biblical. He faced the facts. Abraham was promised a child. He's 100 years old. No child has come. And he says, you know what? In the natural, there's no way that I'm going to have a child at 100. It's not going to happen. My wife is old, I'm old, it's not going to happen. But he was still believing God. But the thing that jumps out to me was he still faced the facts. Some of you need to face the facts in your life that your marriage isn't good this morning. And I want you to know something, it's okay. How many of you guys are in here that have been married for more than one day? Would you raise your hand and say, I've had some very difficult days in my marriage and keep them up? Come on. More than one day you say, I, I mean, I face some difficulties. Hey, guess what? It's okay. But what's not okay is you pretending that your marriage is okay when your marriage isn't okay. I don't know what you're going through in your life that you need to face the fact. Maybe it's your finances. You're pretending everything's okay in your finances, but the truth of the matter is you're just swallowed up in debt and it's controlling you. You know what? It's okay. Anybody else in here besides me and Sarah been in debt before? See, the devil likes to make us to think that we're the only one going through things. But here's what I've learned. If I will begin to share and pretend to open up, I will find out I'm not the only one who's going through facing certain things. Oh, you mean I'm not the only one who struggles in my marriage? No. You mean I'm not the only one who struggles raising my kids? You mean I'm not the only one who's been in debt before? You mean, I mean, I, I, I thought I was. I have to put a smile on my face when I come to this place. Everybody say, how are you doing? Good. Right? Isn't that our response as Christians we're taught when we come to church? How are you doing? Good. Truth is, you aren't doing good. Truth is, my mom just passed away. People kept asking me, how are you doing? And I, my response would be, how you doing, Chad? Good. I wasn't. I wasn't doing good. And there's days I'm still not doing good. There's moments that I'm still not doing good. And I've learned from some people who've lost their parents, there are going to be days and years and months to come that I'm not going to be doing good. But here's the news. It's okay not to be okay. What's not okay is you pretending that it is okay. And what's not okay is you pretending that it's okay and you don't get help for the things that you're facing. That's not okay. 
walking into this place and saying, I'm good. That's not okay. It's not. I want to close. One last scripture. Matthew 26. Excuse me. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 38 says this. Then Jesus led his disciples to an orchard called the oil press. He told them, sit here while I go and pray over there. He took Peter, Jacob, and John with him. Look at this. However, an intense feeling of great sorrow plunged his soul. Who are we talking about here? Talking about Jesus Christ. For those of you who don't know, this is him leading up to the crucifixion. But I want you to look at these words. An intense feeling of great sorrow plunged his soul. You know the Bible tells us that he can, he can understand what you and I are facing? And an immense feeling of sorrow plunged his soul. When you go to him and you say, man, God, I'm struggling. You know what Jesus can say? I understand. I understand. I understand. Look what it says. And he said to them, my heart is overwhelmed and crushed with grief. It feels as though I'm dying. Jesus understands. The words that he used there, overwhelmed. Have you ever been overwhelmed before? You ever feel like you're being crushed by something, the weight of something? Maybe, maybe it's debt. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. I, I don't know what your face is more, but you're just, it's feel like it's, just, it's crushing you. It's overwhelming you. I, I have good news for you. Jesus understands. It feels as though I'm dying. That's how much pressure our Savior was under. It felt like he was dying. Here's something I want you to notice. He didn't pretend it, and he didn't hide it and keep it from people. But here's another truth. He chose to share it with the three and not the 12. He chose to share it with the three that were closest to him and not the 12. It wasn't that he wasn't close to the other nine, but he had an intense relationship with the other three. Some things, listen to me, maybe you shouldn't share with everybody, but for those who are closest to you, you need to learn to share those things with other people and not hold them in. Jesus modeled that for us. He was our example to this thing. He said, you know what? It's okay not to be okay. But what he said is, what's not okay is you pretend everything's okay and not share it with anyone. And you try to walk through this alone. Jesus was inviting these three to end his situation and saying, come, come be a part of this. I'm telling you, I'm overwhelmed with this. Come be a part of this. Listen to me. It's okay not to be okay. But what's not okay is to try to go walk through your facing alone. Everybody just close your eyes.